Hello, and thanks for listening to our talk today on SQL Server 2005 End of Life and SQL Server 2016 New Features. My name is John McPonsky. I'm with Software One. Software One is a company that provides uh, really software sales to corporations. And what's different about Software One than than other companies you might work with is we don't make our own products. We only resell. And at first you'd think, wow, they're just tacking on a little ex added money to everything, and it's actually not like that. When we're able to do that, we're able to buy for you in quantity, and we're able to get you better deals, and we act as a negotiator on your behalf. So Software One, great company to work for, and they're probably an even better company to work with because we have a long-term plan for working with our customers, and that means never trying to go after a short-term deal when we can help them save money long-term. I'm also joined today by James Brannan. James, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, good, uh, hello, everybody. My name is James Brannan, and uh, I work with John on the, the pre-sale architect team, and, and uh, we're going to be talking about SQL today. Yep, and, and we're really excited to be here, and we're excited to, uh, to have this recording being done for us by Spiceworks. I thought I'd throw a word out to them. They're a really great company. Um, we also may be joined by Kerry McPonsky, who happens to be a SQL specialist. And uh, Kerry is my brother, and he's not joining because of nepotism. He's joining because he's one of the smartest SQL programmers I know. So, so hopefully he'll be able to get on. He's got a very busy schedule. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing is, is uh, if you're on SQL Server 2005 today, get off. And, and the reason, and I just want to say that directly, you need to get off it. It's, uh, it's not going to be supported as of April 12th, which, by the way, was a few days ago. And if you're listening to this months from now, it could have been months ago. Um, what it means, it means it's off, when I say extended support, um, what that means is you no longer receive any security updates, and Microsoft's not supporting it. So there's nothing new or nothing patches or upgrades or anything coming out to help you. And getting anything fixed is near to impossible. And that also means that because you're not having any support in that or upgrades or patches, you're also, if you, uh, if you, or if you need to qualify for HIPAA or what are some of those other programs, James? PCI, SOX, things of that nature that are government regulated uh entities so if you're in europe the eu any of that kind of stuff will will come into play for you yeah and then you're out of compliance so this you know great thing these things go out of out of uh, whack one of the cool things about microsoft now though is um as sql's coming out i was complaining about the fact that they're upgrading every two years with what i was calling major releases and uh it turns out the way Microsoft's changing the products now is, is, is evolution. And, and this has been a strong belief at Microsoft for years, and, and it was evolution over revolution. Revolutions when you just say, heck with it, I'm throwing it out, I'm going to start from scratch, and you have all these new guys come in, and then essentially they make a lot of the same mistakes inside the code that the first guys, you know, had to fix over time. And even if the first guys are still around, they, they do some changes that are pretty good, but some things get missed. So if you have evolution, you're just constantly making minor changes to make that product better. You're adding features, you're fixing problems, you're optimizing code. Um, Microsoft's moving to more of an evolutionary approach. And the changes between something like SQL 2014 Service Pack 1 and SQL 2016 are not significant to worry about, and, and you don't need to wait for Service Packs anymore. And I'll mention that again. But um, So what I'm trying to say is, it's going to be easier to stay up to date, and you should make that part of your regular maintenance. Once a year, at least, you should get up to date on the most recent SQL servers. Um, it's bad to let these things sit. Now, what, you know, what the heck is this extended support thing, right? And, and why are they taking it away? And, and what if I don't want to upgrade from 2005, or if that server on 2005 is actually supporting some application I had some guy write in 2007, and we've never changed it. It's sitting around. It's considered, you know, really important for the company by the five people that still use it, and, and we just got to hang on to it, but we need to be compliant, right? So um, 
so when extended support ends, right, um, you won't be able to purchase, unless you use something very special, you won't be able to purchase a, a normal paid support agreement, no security updates, uh, limited non security hot fixes were available and that was that was during extended support right and that's ending what happens now is you're pretty much on your own if you find a bug or something else you can go out to the web and look up problems and try to fix them Microsoft's not going to support you unless and very likely you're a very large company and you're willing to pay a lot of money on a customer support package and, and by lots, I mean tens of thousands. I, I forget what the amounts were for people that still wanted to stay on XP, but they were they were ridiculous. Um, but there were some companies that paid them for a while. But the, the fact is, you you need to you need to get off um, and upgrade. And you're going to get a lot of benefits for upgrading. So, uh, how do you upgrade, right? Um, the first step that I like to tell people to do, especially in larger corporations, is to use the Microsoft Assessment and Planning Tool. And the Microsoft Assessment and Planning Tool gives you the ability to really do a search throughout your entire environment. Um, and James, does it send the information to Microsoft? It does not send anything outside of your environment. So it looks at your environment, it creates, it creates its own little database and stores it on the machine that you're running it from, and that is it. And that's, and that's why I wanted to let you guys know that, because don't worry. If you run this thing, you're not going to get audited, okay? So no one's looking over your shoulder or stealing your data. So you can run it safely. Um, not that any of you don't, you know, have software you haven't paid for or don't know about. But uh, you can run this map tool safely. It'll go find these 2005 servers that are sitting on someone's desk doing something silly, right, or back in the data center. Or um, the other piece is, is there maybe running on one of those vendor systems, right? And uh, I have found vendors that are have been resistant to upgrade their old databases that products run on with upgrades for a long time. And uh, this is kind of forcing them to. But if you've got somebody that still only supports 25, you know, you just need to find a new vendor. Have that program rewritten. Stuff that was written in 2007 can probably be written three times as fast today with some of the new technologies and the way you can do web pages and design. So things have just gotten easier in that respect. So the second step, once you get your map tool, is to have a backup and a rollback plan, right? So, you know, it seems obvious, but don't start messing around with the, the database the way it, right on the server, right? Don't, don't do that. You know, back it up. Um, have a rollback plan for if something happens in the future once you and I mean I mean rollback from once you've upgraded to 2014 or 2016. I don't necessarily mean rollback while you're you're changing the thing. So you create a backup, you re recreate a new set of that 2005 server running with the data you've got. Right, you might have to update some data later. Now you take that and you you run a tool uh, across it. Um, called, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, oh, we'll talk about it in a minute. So you're going to run a tool against that, and, and we'll talk about what that tool is. Um, it's the next step, really, um, we're going to run that tool. We've got to decide which version of SQL we're going to focus on. Well, I'm recommending that by the time you listen to this, that SQL 2016 is probably out. And I would recommend going right to 2016. There's no need to go to a 2014 service pack one and then roll up later. It just make the jump, be in the, in the new environment and ready to roll. Uh, most of the difficulty you'll have when you're, um, when you're doing these type supports are going to be with, with uh, your SSAS packages and, and, and moving to SSIS, uh, which are you know, integration services. They're going to be things like your analysis services. Um, so you're going to have some of that changing, and you may as well start doing it in the new new code because it's getting awesome. Okay, Microsoft's changing the stuff with Power BI, where you can do things you wouldn't even have dreamed of in 2005. So um, the other option, right? We can go to SQL 2016. We can go to 2014. You can also consider using SQL Azure, or Azure SQL, as I wrote it. Um, and when I mean that, I don't necessarily mean, actually I don't really mean it at all. I don't mean put SQL up in the cloud running on a VM 
people do that, and it's a great solution. What I'm talking about here is for these 2005 servers, you can get away with it. But put it put it on a SQL Azure database. And those are databases you can buy in a couple of ways. You can buy them as a direct connect for a single database in the cloud, and they're really easy, man. You just use a connect string just like you did before. You've connected to it. It's a database. You call all the same functions and tools. It's like having SQL in the cloud, which is essentially what it is. Um, so you have this database in the cloud. You can run that. You can also buy it so that you have this ability to have a pool of databases if you want to have more than one. Um, so there's there's different ways to buy it in Azure. Azure is worth looking into. It's it's a great tool, and if it'll handle your problem, especially on these small, rarely used things, you can run it on a really small server or a small instance and save a ton of money. And and again, you know, I wanted to say, you know, shoot the vendor. Did I say shoot? I did. <laughs> James is not awake. So, okay. Steps. We're going to go back to this. Back up the database, right? Um, you can back up the database from where it is. Create a new version of the server standalone, okay? And so it's running if you're going to change anything or test any changes to, to code on it or whatever. Um, th then you're going to take and you're going to run you're the first download the Microsoft SQL Server Upgrade Advisor. Upgrade Advisor is a great tool. So it's going to run against your, your database, and it's going to check for things that are potentially incompatible today, or it's going to look for deprecated functionality. So um, deprecation, I love the term deprecation. Um, I was thinking about deprecation today, and I thought of, uh, what's, it, what's it called when the military blacks out? Uh, Oh, document? they redact. They redact the document. Redacting. It seemed almost like redacting. What what it means is we're going to pretend that didn't exist. <laughs> right. So deprecation means we're taking it away. We've likely, in this case, though, given you something that's better, uh, because we found out that that old feature functionality either wasn't used, or when people used it, they were screwing up their databases, and it needed to be changed with something different that, that created better structures. But deprecation means it goes away. And you're going to look and you may find uh, SQL calls that are deprecated or removed. And that's just something that you've got to kind of live with and, and believe me, things will get better. Um, after that, you look at it, you fix the issues, you run some tests, everything's still running cool, great. Now you can try one of these only three direct upgrade paths, okay? We're going to talk a lot about what you can't do in a minute. But um, the first one is you can attach your 2005 database to a SQL Server 2016 instance and load that sucker. Okay? That's kind of cool. So I get my data there pretty easily, right? So we can try, you know, try the, the, the code and make sure it's working um, and just attach, and hopefully that you're up and running. Now, again, you're going to have more issues with things like your your analysis packages and your your integration services and and what we've seen happen is is it's, it's not necessarily um, when these packages run on on in a middle tier so you say you've upgraded to 2008 2012 2016 14 um, what happens is is at some points they say well we're still going to run this for these guys but we're going to kind of support it in old mode. And what happens is when those analysis server packages come in, instead of it executing directly against the SQL engine like it normally does, it essentially would compile it, run it, you know, as fast as it possibly can, it, it kind of interprets what's there. So it's kind of interpreting your code, and you can see changes as much as 10 times slower as you're, as you're moving from one uh, from, from one machine to the next, which is just, you know, you're crazy, right? You're like, what the heck happened? I, I, moved, I moved from this older server to this newer one, and things just died. Well, that's because, you know, you've, you've got to look at these things and upgrade them. You've got to change them to the new version so that SQL knows it's, you're running, run the tests against them, make a few changes, and they're going to run like lightning um, when they're not being, you know, interpreted. So, so the first way, right, attach the database. The uh, second one, restore a SQL Server 2005 database to a SQL Server 2016 instance of the database engine from a backup. 
That makes sense, right? You attach the database directly or you do a restore of a backed up database. Um, and then you can do the you, you can do the backup of a SQL Server analysis services cube and restore it on a SQL Server 2016. They've tried to make that as compatible as possible. Um, some things you can't do are uh, use well. Let's let's talk about. It. So now you've got your options. Hopefully that's what you were doing back back in 2005. And you're not doing something too crazy. Um, but let's uh, let's go forward and talk about some things you can't do and. James, you were saying you didn't even know why some people would try some of these, but they're interesting. So, yeah, and Microsoft them, listed I these. Think. Yeah, and Microsoft listed these all, and they basically said, "Look, here's a here's a huge list of things you can't do, and by the way, anything that's not in that list of three, you can't do either." So it's kind of like they could have listed everything in the world, and so I, I think they got silly on some of these. Okay, you can't install. SQL Server 2005 and SQL Server 2016 side by side on the same computer. Okay? <laughs> you can't use a SQL Server 2005 instance as a member of a replication topology. So I guess the idea was some people were saying, I know what we'll do. We'll just hook all these servers up in replication and then they'll just, you know, magically, then later we'll remove 2005 from it and everything will be up and running. So that doesn't work. Mirroring doesn't work. Uh, transaction log shipping between the two does not work. Um, con configuring link servers does not work. Um, the other things that don't work are things like you can't manage your server 2005 instance on your 2005 from SQL Server 2016 Management Studio. It's just you're going to have to go through this upgrade process. And so. Um, I'll let you guys read the rest of these, but, but you can see a lot of these are about managing in the new components and the upgrades. So that's the stuff to look out for when you're upgrading. The, the key thing to upgrading is to have a rollback plan. It's probably not as painful as you think it's going to be. Um, you just got to, as my brother would say, you got to put on your big boy boots and, and wade through. And uh, there is a ton of help out on the net. Um, if you look, you'll find many classes by Microsoft, many um, many web webinars that talk about the, this, this porting from one thing to another. You're going to run into specific instances. You can almost always find some guy that had that same problem out on Google and find a solution. One of my tricks when I do searches on Google is I say at the end of the search, I say site colon um, technet.microsoft.com. Okay, because that way I know I'm getting information from Microsoft and not information from Joe Blow. Uh, that said, there are times when Joe Blow actually knows better because he's, you know, been through hell and he doesn't have to, you know, say things are great and they're not necessarily great. So, James, do you have anything to add? No. Um, you know, I'm still kind of reading through these going, why would somebody even try this? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Any, anything to make life easier. So now we're going to talk, we're going to shift now. And, and, and again, we didn't go through a lot of specifics, but I just wanted to kind of get you guys thinking about the fact that you can upgrade. You can go direct. There are some ways to do it. For God's sake, just try it. Run that compatibility tool, and you may find nothing wrong. You know, make it really lucky, and everything's just going to run. So it's worth trying. So next what we're going to talk about is new features in SQL Server 2016. And uh, this is great. And like I said before, 2016, I think of as an update to 2014. Because the way Microsoft's releasing SQL Server now is in essentially short development cycles. I don't know if they're six months or eight months, but they have short cycles. And it's been proven this is the best way to do code. You make a few changes. You test it. You make sure it runs solid. And then you do a release. You don't you don't say I'm not gonna I'm gonna write code for two years and when I'm done I'm gonna release it because so much changes. So Microsoft's doing that now. They merged the SQL Server uh, application team with the SQL Server Azure team, so they're the same team essentially. Um, they do a lot of these rollouts under Azure first. So when you're thinking about, oh, should I move up to Azure, which when some of these features I talk about are merging with Azure, um, it's the same thing. You're going to get the same great functionality up in the cloud as you do locally. 
and, and I think that's something that's that's really exciting to, to understand. Um, so it's been tested in Azure before it goes out to you on premise. Microsoft is not going to make SQL only available through Azure, by the way, just to be really clear. <laughs> that's what I think I think SQL Server and Windows Server will be the the last standouts if that ever did happen, but I can't imagine that would ever actually happen. So let's go ahead and talk about some of these one at a time. Um, query store. Remember when I talked about, you know, you have your queries and you, you port them and they might be interpreted and they might run 10 times as slow, but you don't know which one that is because, you know, oh my God, you know, we have 500. Um, well, this query store is awesome. Query store keeps track of your queries as they're running and keeps track of the time, ranks them, and lets you go in and just check on the status. So, so let's say you hire some new guy and he's in there and you've told him not to touch your queries, but you couldn't help himself late at night. And you come in the next day and, and something you've been running that usually finishes in two hours has been taking 12 hours or whatever. And, and again, you're not sure which one it was. Now you just go to this tool, you find it, you see that there was a change and you track down who did the change and find out what, what they changed and then teach them about maybe better database technique. So that's what I love about Query Store. It's going to make debugging these big problems uh, more of an issue. If you're with a, a small company, you're thinking that, that you know, that, I can't imagine that happening. But, but believe me, once the company gets to be over a few hundred, you have several database engineers and you have people doing all sorts of different types of work. You have people focusing just on analysis and others focusing, you know, focusing literally just on just on integration services. And then, you know, other people writing other pieces. And sometimes, you know, they, they go into the code to, to check it out. But so if this stuff happens. And when you're managing the large systems, this is really going to save a lot of people's butts. Polybase. Okay, so uh, it's funny. When I, when I read about Polybase, the guy that talked about it wasn't really big on Hadoop. I still think Hadoop's really cool. Um, but, but Hadoop, right, is this database in the cloud and basically it utilizes many, many, many servers and each of them have kind of a small piece of a bunch of data and it queries go out through them all and they, they bundle it all up quickly and get it back to you, which is awesome. It also is really good at, at managing unstructured data. Um, what is unstructured data? Well, currently, um, it's still got some structure, by the way. So uh, the <laughs> unstructured data is like an Excel single spreadsheet, right? column, table. And some of these things have, I don't know, 10,000 columns, okay? column rows. So, so they can have a lot of columns. And, and when you're doing unstructured data, some of those columns don't even get filled, but others do. And those columns can be like, you know, it hits somebody's spins the, the wheel at the casino, and at the time they spin it, you take down the temperature and the time of day and, you know, who was on the radio, what sports were playing, all sorts of random crap, right? You have all that stored in there. Um, and then later you'll take that and run some fancy analysis over it and find out that it turns out when the, you know, when the news is on or, you know, when, when what, was the, what was the show where the girl used to spin the, spin the wheel? Wheel of Fortune. When Vanna White appears, everyone stops gambling, so you may as well just, you know, offer bigger saving wins then or something. So you'll offer that type of stuff. So what Microsoft do, they, they included this thing called Polybase. And Polybase lets you process large text files as if they were tables. Okay, so they're like an Excel spreadsheet. So there are large tables, large text files. Um, you can do that in the cloud, right? Just like, so you're not using your own services, so essentially you're offloading the, the search to these other services. Um, and you've also got connectivity to Hadoop. So you have all that today. So now, now you can kind of do it within, within a SQL Server, or you can do that within Hadoop and those other types of services. It's kind of fun. Carrie. Hello. Hello. Hey, thanks for joining us. I want to go back. Yeah, I, I want to go back for a minute. I want to go back for a minute and talk about um, some of the issues you've seen when people are, are porting. Well, in my experience, it's mostly from the uh, ETL side um, where okay. you're moving uh, either your SSIS packages um, 
uh, you know, up up to a, a newer version. The most recent one I was involved with was a 2008 to 2014 port. Um, as we had talked about previously, uh, you they will run. Uh, they call it like I can't remember exactly what the term is. It's like inline upgrade that uh, 2014 will execute those 2008 packages, but they literally upgrade them on the fly, run execute them, and then dispose of the RAM. If you have a lot of packages running within an application, you'll see impact on your application because of that. So you, you really need to uh, go ahead and uh, upgrade them. And, and again, you're just working in Visual Studio in that case. And, and in my case, I simply opened them up. They were Visual Studio 2008, and I opened them up in Visual Studio 2013 and resave them, and everything's fine. So that, that's how I handled the SSIS upgrades. So when you say upgrade, you literally mean just kind of like essentially recompile it by saving it in a newer version? Yeah, yeah, I should have said that. You, you, I just open it and build it, rebuild it in 2013, and that it was as simple as that. Now, there are some tools. I did see a couple of tools out there. In my case, it was just simpler to open them and rebuild them and redeploy them. So, so the thing I was trying to say earlier is that people shouldn't be afraid to go back and look at some of that old stuff because hopefully it's not super complex around 2005 either. Yeah, and in my or, case, or were people I mean, doing was, really complex things? Yeah, and in my case, there was no recoding involved. I mean, it was really just getting up to uh, the newer version of .NET and the build. So, but and it definitely made an impact. They run they run better uh, in the newer on the newer model too. Oh, that's great. Cool. Are there any other kind of issues you saw when people upgrade? I don't know if you were on when we talked about some of the crazy stuff that Microsoft saw people try, like trying to do a replication between a 2005 server and a 2016 to, to make the upgrade work that way. But I I got to tell you, the, most, the best luck I've ever had is detach and attach the database. I don't know if that's a comment or best practice, but I've that, never that is had the best problems. practice. I've and never had problems. Say, say, that's great. So they, that's what they say, too. They say the thing that's supported is reattaching the database or restoring from a backup. So those are the yeah, two, and, main, and I, the two main things. Yeah, and I, I normally do the uh, detach and reattach, and, and you see it you know, going through the steps as it's uh, basically modifying the MDF file for the new, the new version of SQL that's going to be contacted, and it takes a few minutes, but... Um, again, I've 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 done it in place actually, uh, you know, on live servers without too much uh, downtime even. So. That's great. Have you run into pretty pretty well supported where, where features are deprecated, where they go away? Um, not in uh, maybe in some of the packages, but uh, it's pretty rare. Um, you get so much warning. You usually get like five years warning in advance from Microsoft that we're going to get rid yeah. of this. We promise we're going to get rid of this. We promise maybe next time, and then eventually they do get rid of it. But if you That's didn't uh, fix it by, if you haven't fixed it by then, it's pretty much your own fault. Yeah. No. Okay. Cool. Okay. So it sounds like it might be easier than a lot of people are worried about to do this, which is great to hear. So great. All right. So I'm going to continue. I've done Polybase. And Kerry, you can just snap in if there's anything you want to say. So yeah, I was going to say on uh, Polybase, uh, before you move on on Polybase, uh, Hadoop is essentially the same algorithm, uh, the distributed computing that Google uses to search the Internet. So if you want a, a good example of how you're going to use Hadoop to search stuff, well, that's exactly what Google does to the Internet every night uh, uh, with it, you know, running through the text and doing its indexing and everything. So they're basically analyzing large text files so as web pages or would really be the large text files. Uh, and then the distributed processing is what makes it uh, so workable. Um, so, yeah, so that's that has a lot to do with you, how much uh, CPU power you can throw behind. And that's assuming you've got a internet size batch of data. So I just wanted to that's mention right. that. Yeah, and the other thing, yeah, the, the other thing I was talking about with unstructured data was one of the things that we and I talk a lot about with things like you know uh, tens of thousands of columns, which was <clears throat> which I thought was always interesting and in storing you know everything. So um, the other the other next feature we want to talk about is called the stretch database, and this is Microsoft's new capability of literally extending what you have in house to the cloud, so you can store certain tables up <clears throat> in the cloud. And when you actually run a query, Microsoft will take that query apart and they'll send the query up into Microsoft Azure. 
that it needs to process up in Azure, leave the rest of the query local, it'll process both of those at the same time, and then just bring back the results of the query you need locally. And I thought that sounded like a great, um, a great solution for a lot of things, especially big text blob searches. Was that in 2014 too? Or is that just a 2016 uh, edition? 2016. They're saying they're saying it's 2016 only. They've been they've been uh, trying it out. And it's, uh... Go ahead. That looks, sounds like a huge. Adv I was going to say it sounds like a huge advantage. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Because you know, Azure's this is the thing about Azure's cheaper storage. Right, and and the other cool thing is the data you're bringing down isn't all the data each time, just bringing back the results, so you're not paying a ton in data transmission. So I <clears throat> I think it's a great thing too. Uh, the next piece is JSON support, and uh, JSON is JavaScript object notation data, um, and and what that is basically used for is web pages. And so in web pages, people want to store their their object data. Um, in these JSON objects, and now SQL can do queries against them, and I think we even write them. So that's kind of cool for a lot of people that are, are used to database and database uh, databases written in JSON. So if you're doing a lot of HTML work, I think that'll be useful. Um, the next one is row-level security, and and uh, th the way that works is that you can essentially limit uh, access to somebody on a like a customer ID. And so what they're what Microsoft's saying about this is if you had multiple customers accessing your one database or a shared database, you'd be able to lock it down so that only certain customers can get um can get access to, to uh certain rows. So you're basically locking them out of it. Um what they've said is this is the first step of doing this, that it's uh that it's a good first step, but it's not complete. Uh, but it's time to start looking into it. Um, based on what I'm hearing about it, I don't know that it's time to start implementing it, but it's time to start really thinking about it. Gary, can you think of solutions for that that might work for you? Well, you know, I, I see places where they'll they'll split their customers up uh, across. They'll create a database for every customer, so they clone a copy of their database for every customer. This would pretty much eliminate the need for that. They could uh, toss all the customers into a single database without having to worry about uh, anybody, you know, looking at other people's uh, data. So for th reasons like that, I can see it. And then the advantage of having them all in there is about on the back end analysis. Uh, like in my case, I've got like, I don't know, two dozen uh, Fortune 100 companies and all their contract labor data. Um, to have that in a single database means I don't have to join 26 databases later on. So yeah, I can see a lot of, especially now uh, with uh, everything headed toward platform as a service at Azure. So Azure SQL, just one big database I think would make more sense for me. Um, that's, that's, that's what I would initially look at this for. That's great. Well, that's uh, the uh, the next one we're going to talk about here is uh, always encrypted. <clears throat> always encrypted is really cool. Um, encryption was j just in transit, and it's still in transit for SQL Standard and, and SQL Enterprise, obviously. They added at rest encryption in SQL Server 2012, and that meant that when it was on the disk, it was encrypted. Um, this new this new addition means that it's actually encrypted while it's in data. So while it's in memory, it's remaining encrypted until it actually needs to be accessed and used. And that's really useful for certain types of viruses that used to get in and crawl through your memory and steal data once they're once they're in. And um, so I think always encrypted is going to be a big deal for a lot of companies. It's going to be expensive because you'll have to have SQL Enterprise though. Well, I'm actually curious, John, with the, the always encrypted, is it going to slow things down? Is it actually going to make the, the calls take a little bit longer because they have to decrypt before they actually do the calls? Yeah. I'm betting it won't slow it down a lot because from my understanding, most of the database, well, once you're all in memory databases, it may affect it, but a lot of the database time is, is writing and reading from hard, hard disks, which, is, uh, which was what it was optimized for. Um, and Carrie, wouldn't you agree that's one of the things that the databases were great at in the old days because you had no memory, but you had a, you had a big disk space? 
Well, yeah, in our, in our case, we saw a lot more um, as the cash. We increased our cash ability by increasing our RAM. Then, uh, you know, we did see the performance go up because we weren't hitting the hit in the drive. But with respect to what was just said, yeah, I do, I do think you know you are definitely going to see a little bit of overhead on every single one. Um, to that end, I would probably be. Uh, a little selective about which columns uh, we applied that to or that I wanted to apply that to. I, I don't know enough about it yet. I haven't looked into it. I, I would hope that you could narrow down to maybe just tables or columns that you want to keep encrypted or, you know, some way you could filter it down so I'm not encrypting this, like, silly stuff that uh, supports the application as opposed to, you know, transactional data. Well, that's really smart, yeah, encrypting just the data you need, yeah. Um, the other piece is Microsoft's constantly improving their in-memory enhancements. So it turned out that in-memory enhancements they did in, in uh, SQL 2012 and 2014 um, were pretty good with things like column linear store, but what they're saying now is they're, they're supporting more things. I didn't realize they were as limited as it seems like they were limited now. So they have added support for foreign keys, um, you check and unique constraints, which maybe Carrie knows what those are. <laughs> Parallelism. Um, they've increased table sizes from 256 megabytes to two terabytes, which sounds like a great thing to me. And and they've added enhancements so always on might work a little better. Carrie, do you know what a check those, restraint is or a constraint? Yeah, those those are just. <laughs> Those are just parent-child relationships, you know, just uh, yeah, or constraints. You like it has to exist in this table before you can insert it in that table, or the value has to be within this range before you can insert it. Uh, that you know, that kind of stuff. It's like data validation type stuff. Okay, so they're doing more checking within memory as opposed to out. And well, and we've seen yeah, a lot of. And the foreign keys are the same thing. You know, you get two uh, in-memory tables, and now you can relate them by a foreign key. Um, that's kind of neat. Um, that increase to two terabytes is pretty massive. Yeah, didn't you say oh. you saw something like that with Excel even in, when they're doing Power BI now? Oh, a couple a couple weeks ago they were showing um, the uh, expansion at the Microsoft Data Insights. Uh, uh, they had the online uh, two day thing, and uh, yeah, they showed the Excel 2016 with. Uh, I think the file was 800 megs, and it was representing 57 gigs of SQL data um, with 360 million rows in the spreadsheet that the guy was demonstrating on. And he was running cube calcs against it, and it was uh, running pretty pretty nice. So, <laughs> yeah, memory's wow. becoming a big deal with Microsoft now. Power BI sounds like it's getting really cool too. Um, the the next thing I wanted to talk about, and I like to say that my my oldest brother used to say, "Let's get sassy," <laughs> and uh, the R language support. Now, what, what is R? R is an open source version of SAS, and SAS is a statistical analysis system. Um, statistical analysis systems were used by people like epidemiologists. So uh, an epidemiologist is somebody that looks at a population and sees some things that correlate, and they want to use that as data in a scientific uh, paper. But when something correlates to you, it's not good enough. You need to run these packages against it to see how well it correlates. And they use these things called p-values. So they look at a correlation and the size of the population and how that all relates. And you can get a, a, a value that tells you how likely that your data actually means something. So that's one of the biggest uses for SAS. And then it also does you know, reports and graphics and things like that. R is the open source version of that, and you can just use it in SQL now. Now, I don't know that writing an R, becoming an R programmer is going to make you rich. I know that even here in the Bay Area, SAS programmers with epidemiology degrees and make under 100,000 a year, which is not, you know, awesome for the Bay Area. But uh, it it is a great tool, and it may be something you can start using against the stuff you're collecting when you're doing analysis for your company. So it's worth looking into. And then, Kerry, just what, before we end, I was hoping we could talk for just a minute about some of the DI functionality that you've seen that you really like in the, in the new coming versions. Um, you mean in the 2016, or are you talking about the Power BI? Power BI. Because people are really curious about that. Nobody's using it a lot yet. 
Yeah, it's you know it's 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 positioning itself. I don't know if you're familiar with Domo. Domo's a Cabal competitor, um, and Domo's more of a public-facing uh, IP address uh, provider. So you uh, upload your reports, and then you uh, create security settings, user IDs, and passwords, and let uh, the your general public come in and look at the stuff that you've put up there for them to see. Um, the Power BI is uh, kind of similar to that model, but it really in the in the report development looks very similar to Tableau. Has a lot of similarity to uh, what you can do in Tableau. What I find really good about it is $10 a month. They've kind of gone to the Adobe Acrobat model. So $10 a month for the people who produce the reports. Uh, any read-only read access is free. So the person has to sign up, and it, it, it links to your Office 365 account. So you get a Power BI account, and then you can go to anybody's Power BI uh, endpoint that they've set up and given you access to and look at whatever you've been given um, uh, you know, credentials to see. Um, and then you can like edit them and mess around with them and change uh, filters and things like that. So they're very interactive. Uh, the pricing is really what's killing everybody. Uh, I know that where I'm at, it's I, I have no idea with the server. It's probably a small fortune, but it's twenty five hundred dollars a seat for the uh, development software. So uh, ten dollars a month versus twenty five dollars a seat. There's a huge, uh, a huge difference there. So yeah, everybody, I, uh, everybody I know yeah. is looking at it. Yeah, so yeah that's, that's, there's a lot of people looking yeah. at it, and and the advantage is it's mobile ready. So you know, I can I don't have to go through mobile development. I don't have to go through all these iterations of development. We just you just have to really design your reports and and put them up there, and then give your customers access to them. And the other thing you said that was it was really interesting to me is you you only pay that ten dollars a month if you're going to be editing them. If you want just people to view them, they don't have to pay it. Which, um, which actually is a really pr a huge price savings because if you wanted to do that before and, and make these things available electronically, you either had to use SQL per core licensing or you had to have a CAL for everybody that was viewing these. And essentially that's taken away that requirement on, those, on the reporting for SQL, which is great. So, and the fact that they've gotten easier to develop too, that's the other thing people tell me is developing reports in them is much easier. Yeah, you can get a copy of it and put it on your local desktop and work with the Power BI desktop and see how the development is. And it is ridiculously simple. It has got a lot of AI uh, feature feature type stuff in there where when you throw the data up there and it'll start suggesting charts. <laughs> so, and when you go, when you come in and you filter somebody else's uh, a dashboard, uh, it will it may decide that it doesn't like the pie charts and throw up a whole new set of charts so that it thinks that it looks better. So it's pretty neat. Uh, I I really suggest anybody who has got the time to play around with it a little bit. That's great. Well, Carrie, thank you, um, and thank you, James. If you're still there, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, uh, oh, here, thank you guys' time today. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's time. James, was there, we, we did want to pro, uh, tell people about the radio show, right? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll do it then. Okay, so uh, we have a radio show called Tech Talk that's on Wednesdays from uh, 9 a.m. PST to noon PST, Pacific Standard Time, so that's, you know, noon to 3 in the East Coast. And we've been getting a pretty good following lately. We've had, you know, hundreds of listeners a week, and... Uh, we talk about technologies in pretty good detail on each one of the shows, and we go through quite a few. It's really worth attending. You can go to Blog Talk Radio and search for Tech Talk, and you'll find us there first under the Software One Radio Network. With that, I'd just like to say thank you, everybody. You have a great day, and uh, thanks a lot for attending this presentation.